for starting off our worship time this morning. You guys were great. Are you going to Sunday school now? There you go. Watch the steps going out. Follow the leader. There you go. Now, there are announcements listed in the bulletin. This way, this way. There you go. I love you. There you go. Watch where you're going. All right. Come back tonight at 6 o'clock because we have the Jews for Jesus coming back and they're coming to explain about the fall feast and how the Jewish fall feast, how they tie into the Christian faith. So come back tonight, 6 o'clock. Also want to let you know that uh, the Hon the, we're continuing to raise funds for the Honduras team. And so today's the last day to order your T-shirt. We still are going to be selling stock. So if you'd like to invest in the team, uh, please, any donation is acceptable for stock. And we will be um, doing a couple more fundraisers here. We're, we're selling a 31 tote coming up um, that will only be sold during the month of November. And also we have a Culver's Night, October 20th. So if you can come and eat at Culver's, that will help benefit us. Yeah, Culver's is a great place to eat. So there you go. And um, Amy has an announcement this morning. In about two weeks, we have our annual pumpkin patch party, and so, as always, we're looking for donations of individually wrapped candy and cakes and cupcakes and cookies for the cakewalk, as well as people to come help us set up on Friday night about 6.30, as well as the teardown um, about 4 o'clock on Saturday after the program. So if you are available, please let me know. Um, you can email me or just jump at me after church. We'd love to have you. Thanks. Jump at you. Wow, yeah. that'd be great. <laughs> All right. Linda's here. Hi, I'm Linda Kuhn, and I'm here today to invite you to an all-church book club. All-church. Men, women, young people, everyone. Uh, you may remember a few weeks ago, um, it was brought to your attention that the UMW, United Methodist Women, focus for 2014 has been, from the national level to local level, human trafficking and domestic violence, neither of which are pleasant topics, but ones that we are trying to raise awareness for. So the, the uh, book club is being sponsored by UMW and I will be leading your group. Um, our first book is about human trafficking. Uh, it was written from the point of view of a 13-year-old girl. And this is the book. It's called Sold. It's by Patricia McCormick. Uh, we will be meeting on Monday, November 10, from 6.30 to 8 o'clock in the gathering area. And it's my hope that there will be so many of us come that will be in this uh, setting, in the sanctuary. So you're to read the whole book. It's not a book study, but the whole book. Uh, come that night, November 10, and we'll meet here at the church. Be ready to share your opinions, your insights, and discoveries. Thanks so much. Thank you. You can probably find that at the library, or you can uh, purchase it at a bookstore. If you need some help with that, let me know, and I can help you find that book. So everybody's invited to participate in that. We have another group that's going to help get us ready for worship.
we invite you to stand and make a joyful noise to the Lord today.
Let us pray. Lord, we ask that your spirit would be here amongst us in this time of worship and that our hearts may be focused on you. In Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated. It's time for the offering. But first, I want to tell you a couple of things. It was, I guess now, I think I'm for sure that it was mid-July. We'd been gone. Uh, I was not on my walker anymore. We'd been gone one Sunday. And for the Sunday we were gone, I had, I had done a, just Michelle, our secretary, just a little video of me out here in the thing, asking for help, if you remember, for James and Anna Labala, for they needed $5,000. Remember this? To complete four classrooms for the school in Liberia. And the week when we got back, I was shocked. We had already raised the $5,000, but the district superintendent showed up. Remember this? She showed up, and she kind of bragged on us and patted us on the back and said, oh, what it meant to her to see a heart for missions on the website. I didn't even know that we put that thing on the website. She came with her check and was adding it and said, put it wherever the need is in Liberia. And we had some extra money left over from the $5,000 that was needed. In other words, we were through our district superintendent, developing a reputation for generosity, and she has told other churches about that. Oh, no, now we have to live up to our reputation. See? Well, come the end of August, instead of doing scholarships for Liberia, because they're not having school right now in Liberia. You understand that? They're fighting Ebola. We gathered together another $4,000 and added it to $1,400 from our brothers and sisters at the Carlock Mennonite Church. You know who pastors there? Some of you, Pastor Paul pastors there. And we sent over $5,000 together over there directly to James and Anna because very little of the money that is sent to Liberia is going outside of Monrovia. And we got that much money to them in the northern part of Liberia where the need and the help is so gr is the need is great and the help is needed. We're gaining a reputation for generosity. I got one more thing to tell you. We, uh, as of this week, we are officially under $500,000 in what we owe on this building. Is that a happy thing? And now it's, the closer we get, it's even better than that because our finance committee has a policy of keeping $125,000 in the bank as a minimum in case, you know, of issues and troubles. And so we actually, if we just gave them all the money we had in our building fund, we'd be way under $400,000. And I just think that's a, a God thing. I wanted to brag a little bit on you and on your generosity, and on your giving hearts and giving spirits. And I know that if we're gaining a reputation for generosity, did you see the name of the sermon for today? It says, finding a way to live up to your reputation. Well, let's give today in such a way that we live up to our, ge our reputation for generosity. Lord, come. Bless this offering. Bless those that gather it. Bless those who will receive benefit from it in terms of ministry and outreach. And, O oh Lord, bless the generous givers. In Christ's name, amen.
we thank you for this opportunity to give. And we ask that you would use these gifts for your glory, for your kingdom. And may you use our lives so that we can be contagious to others, contagious Christians passing on the faith. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. The disciple class is canceled for tomorrow because Pauline Bond's funeral is tomorrow morning. So we invite those of you that are able to come to that service tomorrow morning here at the church. I want to remember those who are grieving in our prayers and those that are still remaining in the hospital recovering from illness. Let's turn to God in time of silent prayer. Lord, keep us awake so that we might be focused on you. So that we might see the plan that you have for us, for our lives, for our church, for our world. A plan of love and peace. A plan of faith and sharing on our faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Jesus, come into our hearts. not just in this time of worship, but come into our hearts so that every day we are living for you. Keep us awake, watching out, looking for opportunities to share the love that we have for you, opportunities to serve you. Lord, we want to do your will. We really do. But there are times when we fall short, we sin, we turn our backs when we shouldn't, we look the other way when we need to see. Lord, help us not to sin, but to be awake and alive in you, to be focused so that we can endure so that we can be persistent. So that we can live for you. Lord, we give you thanks that you hear our prayers, not just here, but everywhere and in any place. We lift up to you those that are grieving and we ask that you would walk along beside them. Hold their hand. Help them out. Help us to be a church that walks with those who grieve. Be with those who are dealing with illnesses. We lift them up to you. May your healing hand be upon them. Bring them wholeness. Lord, we lift up to you those places and situations where there's brokenness, uncertainty, unrest, And we ask that your hand of peace, that your peacefulness would be in those situations. That your kingdom might come in those places. Lord, help us to be a church that has the reputation of loving you with all that we are and all that we have. We offer this prayer in the name of Christ who taught us to pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
before we dig into the Word, I want to do two things. I want to invite you guys to sign up now for a men's retreat that's November 1st and 2nd. We're going to Menno Haven. It's a beautiful place. And we'll be there from early Saturday morning to mid-afternoon on Sunday. Uh, you can read about it if you find, oh, any, there, there are brochures on the counter over here and a sign-up sheet where the script table is in the back of the gym. But please, consider it. Uh, I believe it'll be two days well spent. Now, also before we dig into the word, I want to quote a repeated phrase from these seven letters. Uh, can you show us some pictures of a certain young man. The scripture that is repeated is to him who overcomes. Jesus says again and again in these letters, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life. To him who overcomes, I will give a, a white stone with their name written on it. To him who overcomes. Overcoming is a theme and it takes perseverance to overcome. So I've asked uh, this week if Rob... Robert Jones would come on up. Come on up, Robert. And he's going to share a little bit about what it was like to do the Iron Man thing. He's the, the, I don't know the name of it. The Iron Man thing he did midsummer during July and uh, how, how that fits with his, his faith and his Christian life. So this is Rob Jones. And at the end, I, I have to warn him ahead of time. At the end, we're going to show you a video of him crossing the finish line. But maybe you IT people will understand this. They, we couldn't show it straight up. You'll be seeing it tilted. So we'll all, ha yeah, we'll all have to lean sideways. But it's really fun to see. So when Rob gets there, we'll, we'll, in, we'll, we'll cheer him on too. <clears throat> Pastor Gary asked me to speak today about perseverance and how it relates to an experience I had this past summer. For those who may not know, I participated in an ultra-endurance event this past summer called an Ironman Triathlon. An Ironman consists of a 2.4-mile mi swim, a 112-mile bike, and a 26.2-mile run for a total of 140.6 miles, all three events done one after the other, and they all three must be completed within 17 hours. Webster defines perseverance as steady persistence in a course of action, a purpose especially in spite of difficulties, obstacles, or discouragement. Something Pastor Lori said in her sermon last weekend caught my attention. She said that faith and perseverance go hand in hand. Without faith, we cannot persevere. Faith produces perseverance, and perseverance strengthens our faith. <clears throat> As you can probably guess, an Ironman triathlon is not something you can sign up for the weekend before the race and be ready for. <laughs> I actually signed up for Ironman Lake Placid in July of 2013, a year in advance, and so my journey began. I realized that perseverance was going to be a key component in preparation for this event. My training started in, Nove in November of 2013, nine months before the actual race was to take place. Training started out at about eight, eight hours per week in the beginning and built to a maximum of 20 hours per week at one point. There were many mornings when the alarm clock went off at 4.30 or 5 a.m. and all I wanted to do was shut it off and go back to sleep. But for nine months I got up and trained having faith that if I persevered, God would help me cross that finish line on July 27th. 2014. <clears throat> so I managed to make it through almost nine months of training with no injuries and no technical issues until my last 40 mile bike ride two days before we were plan planning to leave for Lake Placid. When I re returned home from my bike ride as I was cleaning and inspecting my bike I realized I had a big patch on my tire that was missing the rubber and cord was exposed. To make a long story short I ended up getting my tire repaired while in Lake Placid only to have my other tire ruined while out on a training ride in Lake Placid. Again, got that fixed with one day to spare until bike check-in for the race. But as you can probably imagine, I had a lot of doubts and negative thoughts in my head prior to the race. <clears throat> While airing out my frustrations, a friend of mine gave me some good advice. She simply said, <clears throat> you've put in the time, now have faith and enjoy the day. I realized she was right. <clears throat> I had put it in God's hands and have faith. And as, as you can see from the pictures, despite being pulled out of the swim during a thunderstorm for lightning, <laughs> riding in torrential rain and hail, and having an upset stomach for 23 of 26 miles of the marathon, I smiled most of the day and had faith and persevered. Around 10 o'clock at night on July 27, 2014, I became an Ironman. Faith produces perseverance, and perseverance strengthens our faith. Together they can take your life beyond the ordinary and help you 
realize the extraordinary. Okay, here it comes. It's coming. Robert Jones, Port Illinois. His son Colin told me the girl who screamed was his sister-in-law. <laughs> That's awesome, wasn't it? I, I joked with him at the first service. I said, well, no wonder it was so easy. It was all downhill. <laughs> no, no, he said, I wish. <laughs> bless you. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Robert, Thanks God bless you. you. Awesome and wonderful. To him who overcomes, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life. What a good picture of perseverance that is for us. In today's passage of scripture, the word that kept leaping up off the page to me is the word reputation. Find a way to live up to your reputation. And if you do, and if your reputation is good, because you, you can also live up to your bad reputation, right? But if you're living up to a good reputation, you become the best possible advertisement for Christianity. Reputations. The internet is so all-encompassing, and a reputation is so important, that companies and individuals are willing to spend millions of dollars to fix, preserve, and protect their reputations. When I googled reputation fix, I found hundreds of internet companies vying for the privilege of cleaning up my online reputation, preserving my good name. Here's a sampling of their names. I thought these were creative. ReputationSentry.com IntegrityDefender.com ReviewBoost.com uh, ReputationFix.com And there was also separate companies called ReputationFixer.com and RepFixers.com Or how about this one? LifeHacker.com That's sort of a, the negative view of it all. Or DefendMyName.com or ReputationChamp.com or on, this is much more subdued, OnlineRepManagement.com. <laughs> Though this astounded me, maybe it shouldn't have. Because the Bible says a reputation is super important. You, you know where it says that. It says it when it speaks of a person's good name. For a good name is synonymous with one's reputation. In Ecclesiastes 7.1 it says, A good name is better than precious ointment or costly ointment. In Proverbs 21.22 verse 1 it says, A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. Now I checked how much some of those... those uh, Reputation fixers would cost me. And it was a pretty penny. The idea is something like this. You got a good name over here, and you got a pile of money over here. Which would you rather have? According to Solomon, you'd rather have a, tell me now, a good name. A good name. Whether you're speaking for your company, or whether you're speaking for you as an individual, a good name is worth a whole bunch. And that's why people across the World Wide Web are voting with their dollars. Buy me a good name. There's just a couple of little problems with this. Maybe you've already guessed where I'm going. The problem with these online reputation fixers are, are two they are primarily cosmetic. They'll fix your website, 
They'll fix what people see when they Google you or your company, but they won't fix you or your company. The other problem is that online reputation fixers are only helpful if the bad press you've been getting is unjustified. <laughs> if the bad press was justified, then before you get a reputation fix, you need to fix you. You need to fix your, your business, your corporation. You can't defend integrity.com until you've got some integrity to defend. So in the fifth of Jesus' letters to the seven churches of Asia, he speaks to the one that met in the city of Sardis. And he tells them to live up to their reputation. Their reputation doesn't need management or fixing or boosting. Their reputation is great. Around the Christian world, they saw, knew, and had heard of the church in Sardis. Now, if they could only find a way to live up to their reputation. Hear the word of the Lord. Revelation 3, verses 1 through 6. And to the angel of the church in Sardis, write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers, the one who overcomes, will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. What do you say? Let's pray. Lord, where the shoe fits, help us to wear it. Where we need to have you wake us up. Where we're the sleeping church. Where we're near unto death. Lord, teach us, guide us. Wake us from our reverie. That we might live up to the good parts of our reputations. Humble us, Lord, open us up, ears, eyes, and hearts, that we might be made new, more like you, more effective for you, more contagious Christians than ever before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Some do call the church in Sardis the sleeping church. That's kind of like the moniker that you'd put over the door. Because Jesus instructs them to wake up. So if he says, wake up, my goodness, they must be sleeping. This fits the idea of contagious Christianity. For who wakes up on a Sunday morning and says to themselves, let's go to that church that's asleep. You know, the one that's near death, the one that's slumbering instead of serving. Now let's go there. <laughs> if we could find a way to wake up the sleeping church, we will go a long way toward rediscovering what contagious Christianity is all about. What does the sleeping church look like? Let's sort of diagnose the problems. I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Jesus begins in this letter. The sleeping church has these qualities. It thinks its best days are in the past. It thinks its best days are in the past. If you look at the map, you'll see where 
Sardis was. 600 years, I did say was. 600 years before Christ, Sardis was the capital of Lydia, a province in the interior of Asia Minor, about 60 miles to the east or inland from Smyrna. Like Pergamum, it was built on a mountaintop. It was dominated by pagan temples and one of the ancient world's most important cities. But here's a picture of present-day Sardis. I, I love... Mm-hmm. Not much left, is there? Ruins. Ruins. By the time this letter, I'm talking Jesus' letter, by the time Jesus dictated this letter to John, who in turn had it sent to the seven churches, Sardis had been destroyed once by Persia and King Cyrus' armies, and then rebuilt. Then again by Greece and Alexander the Great's armies, and then rebuilt. And finally, just 60 years earlier, 60 years before the revelation was given to John, Sardis had been destroyed by a monumental earthquake and hadn't quite built itself up again. And in fact, never would. It may be that if the city itself were living in its past glory, maybe the church of Jesus Christ that met within that city also was living in its past glory. Because you know, the church can pick up the sins of the culture around it. The church, you know, is not growing. Not if you take even all the growing churches and all the dying churches in America and put them together. The church of Jesus Christ in America is not growing. Where is the church of Jesus Christ growing? It's growing in places where they don't have clean water to drink. It's growing in places where they're fighting the Ebola virus. It's growing in Africa, in Central America, and in some of the hardest places of the world to be a Christian. That's where it's growing. I guarantee you that when the Christians meet for worship, when they're able to in Africa, they're not thinking about their past glory days. They're thinking about the present how can we reach the lost with the gospel? They're thinking about the, the, kind of the Islamic invasion. We're talking the faith movement to the south in Africa. And they're not worried about how to fight them, how to beat them militarily. They're worried about how to win them and lead them to faith in Christ. They're looking towards the future. A sleeping church is a church that thinks its best days are in the past. But a living church is saying, Lord, how can we make disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world today and in the days ahead? Another characteristic of the sleeping church is that it simply takes too much pride in its reputation. One dangerous thing that I didn't say about a reputation for faithfulness is that it, that is the reputation, can itself become a replacement for faithfulness. As wonderful as a good reputation can be, it turns sour when we turn it into an idol. It's kind of like the grape juice in the walk-in refrigerator here in our church. We've got bottles of it. And every once in a while, I'll go in to pour the grape juice for communion. It's going to become the blood of Christ for us, you know, in a spiritual way, right? And I'll unscrew the lid on that grape juice, and I'll go, whoo! This grape juice has become Mogan David all of a sudden. being the teetotalers that we try to be, at least as far as communion is concerned, I dump that stuff out. Rinse it out, put the container in the recycle bin, and get a fresh bottle. It's not unlike what our Lord does. If the Lord smells the idolatry of trusting 
our reputation more than we trust Him. Our Lord, the Scripture says, may come to us and the image is remove our lampstand from its place and go find another bottle where the grape juice is good. A sleeping church takes too much pride in its reputation, turns sour and must be thrown away. A sleeping church also is a church that has become thoroughly secularized. In, in other words, if an objective observer looked at the Christless world and the church within it, a secularized church doesn't look or smell or act any differently. Greed, ambition, ladder climbing, immorality, hatred, unforgiveness, bitterness are all just as present in this church that's too secularized and the world around it. Studies consistently show this to be true for the church in North America. The church in North America might as well not exist. This is what these studies say. Because the same amounts of sin and pride and idolatry and sexual immorality exist within the church as outside of the church. The sleeping church has become thoroughly secularized. Another aspect of the sleeping church is that it simply doesn't know how close it is to death. It doesn't get it. There are seven lampstands mentioned in Jesus' letter to the church in Ephesus. There are seven stars mentioned in this letter to the church in Sardis. What are these lampstands and stars? Well, the last verse of Revelation chapter 1 tells us, as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels, the messengers of the seven churches, either actual angels or actual messengers who were sent with these letters. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches themselves. How close with Sardis' star, that is their angel, to removing Sardis' lampstand from its place. Jesus says they were close. So what does he say? What does Jesus say as a way to help a sleeping church to wake up? First he says this, I have a wake-up call and it's just for you. You notice these letters are individualized. No two of these churches are identical. Jesus has a special word to, for the angel of the church of Sardis write. And these specific things are what God, through Christ, wants to say to that church. Don't you wonder? Don't you wonder if Jesus were going to dictate a letter to our angel? the angel of the church of Morton United Methodist Church, don't you wonder what that angel would say to us? What God would say to us in that personalized letter? Or maybe God wouldn't write just our church. Maybe Jesus would compose a letter to all the churches in Morton. Maybe the first thing on Jesus' list would be, why are you meeting in so many different places? Why aren't you one? Why do you fuss and fight? Why do you put each other down? You know, I just wonder, what would Jesus say if he wrote a letter to us? What Jesus says to the sleeping church of Sardis is, I have a wake-up call and it's tailored just for you. Then he says, you cannot live on past works and reputation. If you try to, the past becomes your idol. And there's nothing to do with idols, folks, except to tear them down. Instead, 
we are to make our reputations, our good news, our good names, alive every day, anew every day, through faith in Jesus Christ and through the power of His Spirit alive in us. What does Jesus say to a sleeping church? He says, you must admit, being spiritually asleep spells death. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. So Jesus would say this to a sleeping church, wake up. He says, wake up, strengthen what remains. I've not found your works complete. Finish the good works to which I have called you. Don't give up. Don't stop your training. But carry it out to the end. Wake up. And then I added, smell the gospel. Wake up and smell the gospel. Smells like, if you're a coffee lover, like really good fresh coffee. (laughs) Wake up. And smell the good news. Because that's, what Jesus is talking about in verse 3, when he says, what you have received and heard. Hang on to it, remember it, keep it, return to it. What you have received and heard is the gospel, the good news about Jesus. Now these aren't going to appear on the screen, but you could recite the first one with me. If you know the difference between King James and, and other versions, try King James. Ready? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The gospel, the good news. Jesus, wake up and smell the good news. It's repeated over and over again in the scriptures. Just this morning. My devotions were on 1 John 5, 11 and 12. Another restatement of the gospel. Listen. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. I thought of 1 Timothy 1.15. This saying, this bit of good news, is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. One of my favorite retellings of the gospel is to pair up two scriptures, John 15 and Philippians 4. John 15 says, apart from me, Jesus is talking, you can do nothing. But Philippians 4 says, with Christ, I can do all things because he gives me the strength. What are we to do? When Jesus says, wake up and smell the gospel, what are we to do with it? We are to remember it. We're to keep the gospel current. It is our constant companion. We are sinners saved by grace. Remember it. Cherish it. He says, keep it. Guard the gospel like you would guard Fort Knox if it had any gold left in it. Guard the gospel for it's worth far more than gold. And then return to it. That's what Jesus means when he uses the word repent. Turn around, head back to the good news. For there in the good news, our faith remains present. Our faith is empowered for the future. Repent, change your mind. A church doesn't stay alive on its reputation. It remains alive through dependence upon the good news which is always present and always has implications for the future. Now if these words don't wake us up, Jesus says, there is a ruder awakening coming. And I quote, if you will not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Ooh, that's like Jesus saying, Don't make me come down there. But very seriously. Jesus concludes this letter with a truth we all believe. 
I hope we do anyway. Don't you believe that even the worst of churches, even the deadest of churches, even the sleepiest of churches still have faithful members inside of them? And it's those faithful ones that form the remnant, the pool of energy and new life, a source of hope and a place to start for God's reviving, refreshing spirit. Here's how he says it. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Jesus says this to them because the contagious church depends upon contagious Christians. The contagious church depends on each one within it. So Christ's call to all of us is his call to each of us. And that led me to a memory. I was doing my devotions and I was writing down the date for today, which is, everybody knows, October. So what did I think of when I thought of that date? If you're old enough to remember because we don't celebrate it much anymore. Columbus Day. Columbus Day. And thinking about Columbus Day reminded me of something, a reference my grandfather made to Christopher Columbus often. It happened at the place where I wanted to be at family reunions so desperately. I would kibitz. I would sit at the corner of the table where my grandpa and my great uncles were playing cards. Sometimes it was pinochle, but more often it was euchre. Euchre. Now, if you don't know the rules to euchre, this may not make sense to you, but, but if you do, if you don't, just look it up. Google it, it'll tell you what. Euchre is this great game. You use half a deck, and, and you're in partner with who's ever across the table from you. And I would wait for this, because I loved it when my grandpa would say it, and he'd say it every time. Because if he had a really good hand, he would take a deep breath, and he'd say, well, Columbus took a chance. I'm going alone. <laughs> See, you can actually go alone in Euchre and let your partner rest. And he'd say, Columbus took a chance. I'm going alone. And then I had the joy, because he was rarely wrong, of watching him slap those cards on the table, skirpalat, like that. And he'd make a good noise with each one. And he'd gather in those five tricks, and he'd win the hand. Ooh, it's so much fun. Um, I want to tell you about a chance that I encourage you to take. I'm not going to kid myself. I'm not thinking that every one of you here is either a Christian or a dynamite Christian, but I want you to consider this. Pascal made this statement about the chance he would encourage you to take. He said, this all may be true, or it may not be true. This gospel stuff. The gospel stuff may be true or it may not be true. If it's not true and you live your life as though it is, what have you lost? Not much. But if the gospel, the good news about Jesus, is true, if it is true and you did not live your life by the gospel, then you've lost everything. It's called Pascal's Wager. I encourage you, go all in for the gospel. Try him. Try it. Try the good news on. Live it. Whether it's taking a step of faith for the first time or whether it's taking that extra plunge so that we and you won't be a sleeping church but a living church. One of my favorite songs for allowing us that opportunity is one Jane said I could play with with her. It's called When It's All Been Said and Done. I want you to think about Pascal's wager and go ahead and in you know, poker terminology, go all in with Jesus today. Let's stand and sing.
when it's all been said and done. There is just one thing that matters. Did I do my best to live for true? Did I live my life? When it's all been said and done All my treasures will mean nothing Only what I've done for love's reward Will stand the test of time Lord, your mercy That you look beyond our weakness And find purest gold in my clay Making sinners into saints I will always sing I will always sing your praise Here on earth and ever after, for you shown me heaven's my true home when it's all been said and done. You're my life when life is It's all been said and done. There's just one thing that matters. Did I do my best to live for true? Did I live my life for you? Lord, I live my life for you. If you're willing to sort of pray that song, then just try this prayer after me. Say, Dear Jesus, I want to live my life for you. I want to dive in. I want to go all in for you. Trusting your good news and living it in such a way that a difference might be made in me, my church, and my world. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's uh, sing a verse of I love to tell the story. Okay? and His glory, of Jesus and His love. I love to tell the story, because I know it is true. It satisfies my longing, as nothing else can do. I love instructions. If you see uh, Mary Alice, wish her a happy 90th birthday, Mary Alice Evans. If you see the Naps, wish them a happy 65th anniversary. It's a happy deal. And uh, 
If you're of a mind, don't forget, tonight we celebrate Christ in the fall Jewish feasts right here at 6 o'clock. So go, tell the story in Jesus' name.